Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. I'm here today with Tom Winter, which is an incredible name for someone who's Polish because uh, it doesn't sound Polish at all. So maybe there's a backstory there. Tom is the co-founder and chief growth officer at SEO Wind, a company that uses data to build SEO optimized content effortlessly. He also has experience in helping SaaS companies expand globally, which is an essential part of the conversation we're going to be having today. So thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Tom. I appreciate it. Uh, why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about SEO Wind and how you got to this point in your career, and we'll go from there. Thanks a lot, Sean. Thank you for the invite. I'm happy to be here and share some thoughts on my side. Uh, so I'm basically in love in B2B SaaS tools and the potential that they can scale across the globe uh, without any problems. Uh, marketer and salesperson by heart, growth hacker uh, by nature. Uh, about 15 years ago, I started a content marketing agency and I've helped many customers for a couple of years. Then I co-founded Deskler, which is one of the best tools to test developers' skills. Uh, I, helped, I helped to build it from zero to paying customers in over 85 countries. Now, Right now, uh, it's probably over 100 countries that we have paying customers in. And I decided to take all my SEO knowledge uh, and build a SaaS tool to drive organic traffic through data-driven approach. Uh, SEO Wind helps to make SEO results scalable and predictable at the same time. Uh, when I have time, I try to advise startups on how to grow globally. Uh, especially, I love to remove barriers that they think they have and empower them to scale up across the globe. And this is basically what I do. And this is my background. You call yourself a chief growth officer. What's the difference between that and a chief executive officer? My focus is purely on growth. So a combination of marketing and sales uh, skills. Uh, I love to actually think about marketing and sales as two things working together, because in my opinion, these are not two separate departments. These are people that are uh, driving growth together. And this is where like I excel, uh, where CEO is rather a person that uh, drives the vision of the company, helps to uh, connect all the dots in the whole company. I can focus only on growth. So it sounds like you put marketing and sales together as one department. Exactly that. Like I'm a little bit a technical person with combination, as I mentioned, like of marketing and sales team. So I can deliver a lot of things and test out on my own. Uh, of course, developers don't like what I do uh, because my code looks really, really bad, but it's enough for a POC to test it out if it actually works, uh, to deliver it within a day or even a couple of hours, test it out, see if that's a value for the customer. And then the developers can take it over and rebuild it from scratch because we've now proven that it works so we can actually build it. Yeah, there's a lot of tools out there now that don't require any sort of code that like, for example, Zapier, where you can just plug and play APIs between a spreadsheet and you could build out a business intelligence dashboard using Zapier and other applications within within a few days. And then you go, okay, I've basically built a multi-million dollar system. Now, you know, you can go and build it yourself if you really want to, but otherwise we can just use it here. I, I find it really fascinating how these tools are, are making it much easier for marketing teams and sales teams and product teams uh, and customer service teams, really anyone, any, any department can benefit from these, these tools. Um, why did you choose to focus on SEO specifically? for this company? This is something that I have did for, I think, last 15 years. I helped out many companies uh, to build organic traffic, something that is predictable from their side and how they can build, scale it uh, in a predictable way. Uh, so I have a lot of frameworks that I use on a daily basis. And I thought like, okay, let's see if we can automate the same things that we're doing on a daily basis and helping out different companies. And let's put it into a SaaS framework and let's see if they can actually get similar results uh, using the similar frameworks that we use, like by just using an Excel sheet, Ahrefs, SEMrush, and all other tools that they're out there. But it took a while. It took a lot of time to implement it. So we thought, let's automate it. Let's use a little bit of machine learning data, and let's do it. 
And regarding what you said earlier about a POC that you can just assemble things, like put things together, uh, even there is a term in, in development glue code. It basically means like gluing two things together just to come up with a new thing. Of course, like you don't have to rebuild things from scratch. You don't have to reinvent. It's not about doing R&D. Like 99% of the market, it's not R&D. It's just like gluing different things together and developing something new. And this is something that I see that many startups just don't know how to do, how to do a proper POC that you can sell something that doesn't exist or that like it doesn't look under the hood as it should be. Uh, and this is a problem that I see all the time. We should be ashamed of things that we show to the to the public. If we're not ashamed, like that means that as somebody said, I think it's from zero to one. If we're not ashamed, that means like we basically launched too late. I think that was Reid Hoffman. What is the benefit of SEO for a SaaS brand? Not only for SaaS brands, but as a SaaS product, for sure. Uh, SEO is bringing organic traffic. So the traffic that we call free traffic, it's not actually free because if you would pay with ads for the same traffic, for the same keywords, you would pay a lot of money. So if you can build organic traffic uh, and get it for free, that means you don't have to invest money in that and you can monetize this traffic. If the problem that I can see is building organic traffic is really hard uh, and many companies don't see a way to scale it. If they don't have the competence inside the company, they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to uh, employ content writers, for example, what these content writers should do. And what we saw is that if you're data driven, uh, you can actually make it scalable because you have to go with a certain pattern uh, to build content on your website, to build org organic traffic. I will actually say a story that I had, like, because I'm like really a creative person. I, I love to create different things. And I always think I'm like the most creative person in the room. But the problem is that if I really excel with my creation, like regarding organic traffic, I develop something totally different than the market likes. Even if I think it's the best thing in the world and then I launch it and then I see zero organic traffic, that means I was wrong. Uh, and Google was right, like because Google didn't think that I built something that was okay. And always when you're trying to build anything, either it's a product or you actually creating content that drives organic traffic, market is always right. So when the rubber hits the road, this is the moment that you see like if you were right or if you were wrong. So I love to actually test out things as soon as possible just to see was I right or were I wrong? Like, was it wrong? So this way we wanted to create a, a tool that will make it predictable because we we know that SEO, like Google it, it owns 85 or 90% of the search market. Like there's only Google and, and nothing else. So if you type in something into Google and Google shows you certain results in the search, search engine ranking, uh, search engine, then basically this is the intention like google just caught the intention that what you wrote in uh in the search engine and showed you something that they predict will be the best answer they always want to give you the best possible answer this is their job this is like how they work so what we wanted to see is exactly to understand what google shows there and help to build a brief for an article for a certain type of content that will best fulfill or best answer the questions that people can have. So based on SERP results, we are actually bringing the topics uh, and checking for the topics that you should add to your articles, to your content. And this way, based on data, we're predicting what's expected from the market, uh, not to make mistakes. So there's something that you mentioned about speed. You said you like to test things as fast as possible. From what little I know of SEO, doesn't it take 
like weeks or months to see a benefit from SEO specifically once you've made some sort of change in the website based on the rankings and, and the organic traffic? Yes, it takes weeks, months, couple of months, sometimes like many of them. But to get to see if you have any traction, like it's easy to even check it with Google Search Console. So, for example, if you write a new article on a certain topic and you can see that Google already ranks you on 90 something position, that means you're getting there. Like nobody will go to the ninth or 10th page of Google uh, and nobody will click it. But that means you're getting like some traction in Google, now you can be better. So if you can see that you have more and more visibility uh, in Google, no clicks, I mean visibility, so fourth, fifth, sixth page of Google, that means you're getting some traction. And this is something that you can see really quickly in just a week or two, uh, because cr Google crawls your page all the time. How would you suggest a SaaS brand that wants to get started with SEO begin because my assumption is there there may be some sort of local seo going on when they want to expand globally so we'll move towards that so i'm, I'm trying to prime you and the audience for like that that uh evolution in a, a brand's thinking and, and all of that so let's start it like you know if you want to get started right now as a SaaS brand with seo let's say you have a website but you don't know anything about seo and you want to start applying seo how do you get involved so first of all like you have to think about your market like uh, let's start with are you b2b b2c or maybe enterprise sales so you exactly know who are you targeting uh, your content say if you will define it uh, and most of the SaaS like have uh, an idea who might be their customers uh, you can actually start defining what exactly they're looking for I would start with some like 10 maybe 20 keywords that you can start with uh, that might be the keywords that people are looking uh, for, your audience is looking for, to find products or similar things connected to your products around you, and then start writing the content. And the really, like the key word that I would say is the intention. So if you have certain keywords that you think are good, check it in Google. If you put these keywords into Google, you will define exactly if if people if people are thinking about the keyword the same way you do i've made the this mistakes many times that i thought a keyword means something and it meant like totally something different uh so for example we can say independence day what do you think what is it it's a movie so yeah exactly this is a, as an american it's a movie it's a movie it's not like not a date, like nothing. If you check it in Google, actually, this is quite a funny thing because if you check independence in Google, most of the year you will see a movie. And just once, like a couple of days in the year, Google will show you actually the holiday. Uh, so, like, you have to check the intention of the keyword uh, just to understand exactly are you uh, focusing on it. So, for example, I had a customer that had a tool connected to the office like something connected to the office and they thought like, oh, I we will go like with a keyword that is office something. And unfortunately it was a series. Uh, so you have to understand exactly what Google thinks on the other side, because what you think, okay, that's cool. But like Google is always right. They have the data. Uh, once you have these starting points, like so these primary keywords, you can start defining like actually a long list of secondary keywords. This is a long, long list. I would say a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand of keywords, but, but the starting point is always like the first keyword, like the primary list of keywords that you, you start with. Once you have it, probably start creating content. You can drive like a mix of content is best. I would say articles is just one way of uh, doing content, but you can basically use the same content on LinkedIn. You can use it for videos. You can deliver content in so many different ways and redistribute, redistribute it like in different ways, basically even sometimes the same content. So you don't have to write it from scratch every time. But if you will do it constantly and if you will drive it this way, you will bring organic traffic to your website. Okay, so let's take a little leap forward here. Let's assume you have a website, you know your keywords, you've got content going, you're a brand, you know, you're getting revenue. And 
you want to think about, you know, the next country that you want to move into. Because hopefully you, you haven't just said, I'm going to launch a product that the whole world is going to use from the start because chances are, no, you, you can launch it that way. But inevitably, you're going to end up having a specific region find your product, right? So for example, with my own podcast, when I look at my results, typically the largest number of people listening to my podcast come from the US, but also from Singapore. And I know exactly why that is. It's because I promote heavily in Singapore because my startup is based in Singapore and I've done a lot of work in the startup ecosystem in Singapore. So, you know, I, I know where my people are coming from. Now, does that mean I don't want people from Europe? Like, no, I'm, I'm talking to you. You're from Poland. Of course I want people from Europe. I want people from Africa. I want people from all over. But I haven't put the effort into promoting in those regions and therefore I don't have that response. So with that caveat, um, if you're a brand with a product revenue, whatever, and you're looking to expand, how do you position your website or your content with SEO? And how do you think about that so that you can target those outside of paid ads, right? Because again, your goal is, is organic. First of all, you have to think if your tool is language specific or not. This is like the, the basic thing. If it's language specific, then probably the solution would be like have content for each language and uh, that's the e easiest way and probably as you're as we're doing a podcast here probably meet people within the region more people within the region then assumption is hypothesis that you will gain more traffic from certain regions so one trick for example that i'm using uh, is like i'm creating most of my content in english like i know a couple of languages but like english is the language that i use the most uh, so when I'm creating content, uh, I'm using a little bit of technology to rewrite the content in different languages. So basically I'm using DeepL uh, as a tool uh, to rewrite the, everything what I write on my blog and translate it into languages that I'm interested in. Uh, this way Google starts to understand my website uh, that like it's in a couple of different languages. It's scalable, like it's just adding a little bit of money to DPL to translate it into different languages. Uh, so this is the easiest way. But like you have to understand that it's rewritten using uh, machine learning. Uh, so it will not be perfect. But some of the tools that I work with are not language specific. So for example, like the tool that I co-founded, which was DevSquare, uh, is a tool to test developer skills. Like programming is basically in English. It doesn't matter like which country are you in, the, it's in English. So all the countries, uh, it doesn't matter if it was Spain, uh, Singapore, France, or whichever country, they use the tool in English, which was very helpful from our perspective because we didn't have to translate it anyhow. Uh, we, of course, connected with many people. So you have to think about uh, organic traffic is not a free traffic. Free traffic. You also have to use uh, outreach and invite people, do some webinars, do some different things. Uh, if you just spray and pray your content, like this is what you will get. Uh, so probably getting additional backlinks from certain countries will help you out to drive traffic and show uh, you your posts in different countries. Also, when it comes to specific languages, Google uh, tries to evaluate what kind of language do you have set up in your browser. So that's another thing that you have to think about on your customer side. So if somebody has set up like the, the browser language to Spanish, uh, probably more of Spanish content will show up in Google because just because of the setup uh, of the browser. So that's why like I would use, for example, automatic translation of the website, uh, because then if the same article is translated into five languages, Google will just choose uh, the proper language and show up like with the article in the proper language. You, you just need to set up a couple of uh, technical things on your website to have H Hraflangs. Uh, which is a link for Google to understand exactly which page is in which language. And if they see um, the same article in a different language, they know exactly which one to match to, to, to it. I have to say, I do find that frustrating, that specific feature, because 
for example, uh, you know, when I'm in Portugal, I'll have global websites that'll force the, the website into Portuguese for me, even though my browser is set to English. And I have to either go to their, the bottom of their page to like manually change the language, or I have to go to the, the uh, top bar and, and remove like the P the PT um, dash BR whatever, and, and replace it with E N U S so that I'm forcing it into the U S English version. Um, which can be frustrating. You mentioned this thing called Deep L. Do you have a, a URL for this? Is there some some way that I can put it in the episode links? Just because I, I'm curious for myself. Yeah, deepl.com. And they have an API access. If you're using, for example, WordPress, it's like really easy to connect it to WordPress. There's like a, one plugin that you have to install and then like access API. Uh, from DeepL. Now I know that there's also like um, a WordPress plugin for multi-language. Yeah, there are many of them. So that you, so like you can build your website in multiple languages, but not every company uses WordPress. For me, WordPress is a love and hate relationship. Uh, I really love it for the speed that I can like develop things there. Uh, because like most of the things are already there, I can test out many solutions and like connect them to each other and it works better or worse, but it works. Uh, but at the same time, like WordPress is so heavy and the speed, like I can, it's just like a huge tool. I don't need 95% of WordPress. Uh, so like it can do so many things, but it's just too heavy, uh, but you can optimize it. Like that's why I say like it's a love hate relationship. Still, I would prefer to use it and not to use it because the way it works and how fast I can implement things. Let's refocus on using SEO for globalization and content. So as we've already kind of described, you normally take a few weeks to a few months to see a benefit from implementing something related to SEO and content in your website. So if you're planning a campaign to expand into a new country, a new region, how soon before you actually do your marketing push, should you be preparing your SEO based content in this other language and publishing it so that you can actually have the benefit if you do paid ads um, or an, or an organic campaign to be able to maximize that benefit. So you're not just, blowing money for no reason okay like from my perspective uh i'm a fan of not putting anything into a drawer so not preparing too long for certain uh actions uh definitely what i would start with because i would talk to people i would talk to people for, from certain regions i would try to outreach uh to potential customers using even linkedin just to understand the language that they're using the paint that they have the uh, because each region like thinks a little bit differently. Uh, so if you understand exactly what the region might think, the more you talk to the people, the, the better you will understand. Uh, I remember we talked last week that you lived like in different places across the globe and you, for that reason, you better understand these specific regions of the world, uh, which makes a lot of sense because you connected with many people, you talked with many people, and that's why you can understand them better. And it's the same with marketing and sales. You have to understand certain reasons. But going back to your question, I would start if I would start with putting KPIs uh, on a piece of paper. Uh, and my hypothesis, I always try to start with a hypothesis just to understand better if I'm reaching a goal or I'm not reaching a goal. Uh, because if you have a hypothesis in the beginning and what kind of things you have to do, so kind of OKRs, uh, if you know what you planned for, then you can actually decide if you succeeded or not. If you're waiting like three months to actually define these things, then I always like in this, in this situation, I will always say like, no, it succeeded because I want to feel good. So if you define the hypothesis in the beginning, you plan out like what you have to do to actually reach your goal, then you will actually understand if you succeeded or not. 
Uh, so I would start putting content out as soon as possible. I would define a schedule that we want to put out the content. So for example, twice a week, uh, I would define additional things that I would do around it. So for example, contact specific people, go to podcasts, uh, outreach to specific uh, personas uh, on LinkedIn. But I would define it in the beginning. This way we can actually understand if we reach the goal uh, or not. There is like a, a, a funny thing that about like riding dead horses. Like there's a lot of ways of riding dead horses, especially in business. Uh, so we can find like many ways of riding dead horses, but this is exactly it. If you don't know that you're riding a dead horse, like you will continue or just like stop something just before you succeeded. So uh, I wouldn't... I, I I would stick to the plan. Whatever happens, I would stick to the plan that I had. Would you write this content in English and then just like target deep L so that it, it starts to translate into Spanish or Portuguese, whatever, uh, as soon as possible so that the content is there? Or would you rewrite it in this other language and then republish it on another post page, for example? It will still be a different post page, like using deep L. Uh, but I would find the simplest way possible. Like I'm a lazy person I'm, I, I, and I really love it uh, because like being lazy makes me find ways to achieve goals in a faster way or at least prove that it works or it doesn't work. Like it, when I know if something works, then I can scale it up. I can make it predictable. I can put more money on that. But if I'm developing something for half a year just to know if it works or if it doesn't in a year's time, that's not the best idea because you're putting, like you're gambling, you're putting a year of your time and you don't know what will be the result. So like if you can get some information a lot faster, like any indicators, uh, I like to also like when I have my hypothesis, I like to also add something that I call leap of faith metrics. So for example, uh, for me, leap of faith metrics, like, of course, my metric, my main OKR would be sell. Like, I want money in my bank account. But if I only count about, like, on selling, that would make, like, the process take half a year. So what are the leap of faith metrics? So some kind of metrics that indicate that I'm closer to selling. But I can watch them, like, a day from now, maybe two days. For me, for example, it can be just setting up meetings with people because if somebody can pay me with their time for a meeting, like that means they, they want to actually learn more. And that happens a lot faster than actual sales. So setting up certain goals, like if you, if you do a POC, do a POC that you can launch within a couple of days and then set up goals that will show you that you're closer to your goal, but they're not the actual goals that you're looking for because these will take a lot of time to actually understand them. Uh, so I would do a fastest POC possible. If you don't have language skills on board, use DPL. Why not? If you do have the language skills like German, French, Spanish, set up like some, some different articles in this language. What happens when you have a SaaS brand that the product is only in English? <laughs> but they're pushing out content in other languages to get customers to use them. Cause so for example, like if, if I were to promote content in Mandarin to mainland China, they don't speak English. They're going to not be able to use my product. So you have an answer, like makes no sense. But then there's also other countries like in Europe where a Spanish person may want to read that article in Spanish, but they could still use your product in English. As I mentioned before, like if your product is language specific and you don't have the skills on board, for example, with China, but China has a lot more technical problems. I don't know if it, even if it's possible in most cases to launch a product in China because you will be blocked by different things. But looking at different countries, if you if your product is language specific, you have to have these languages, like these skills on board in your company. But for example, I have, like with DevSkiller, 
we knew that Defsker was testing developer skills and testing developer skills was always in English because programming is in English. That wasn't a barrier, but we could translate the articles into different languages and people didn't even have a problem with getting into the system, which was in English. And then we never translated it by default. We never translated it into Polish because it didn't make any sense. Uh, so like if the tool is not language specific, nobody has a problem with that. And this is one of the barriers that actually people think that might be a problem, but just talk to the customers. Like they will tell you out loud, like if this is a blocker or it's not. Is there a reason to build a product that's language specific? Yeah, there is a lot of reasons, like because there are many niches uh, that uh, need the language specific product. Uh, so like there's a huge need, like I think most of the market would be language specific. So for example, with SEO wind, like we know that results need to be language specific. Now we're talking to the customers to see if actually the tool itself has to be language specific. We don't know, but like we will talk to them and see if we need to translate it or not. But looking at anything connected to sales, for example, if you're going into sales, uh, if you have a product in SaaS that it goes to sales and somebody as an end user doesn't know English because they're in Poland, they're in France, they're in, in Czech Republic and they will use your tool on daily basis and there's no need for them to know English. This is a language specific tool. They will use it in certain language and you have to translate it. You have to help them out with like all the documents and help and so on. So they know how to use your tool. So like, just think about if your tool is language specific or not. Here's a free business idea for anyone who's listening. Build a tool that helps you automatically on the fly change the language of the app that people are using. So for example, you're saying DeepL. You can have DeepL scan your website and change the content based on the language of the browser the person's on. Why can't a web app have that function? Why isn't there a tool that, that no codes the, the language that the user is using it on? We're still not there with AI, like, because the whole idea behind AI and writing, uh, using AI, uh, is that they need to understand AI needs to understand, uh, the, the context and the intention of a person. And it's not always easy to translate. As I mentioned with independence day, that's a AI translating what we write into Google search uh, into content that possibly answers the question. And the same thing goes with translation. Sometimes it's not that easy to translate like small pieces uh, of data uh, into uh, something different. Like I, I, I played around a lot with AI and writing and translations. That was just fun. Uh, I like to break things and just to see how it works. Uh, and for example, one of the AI models that is very famous for writing skills is GPT-3. And there's like, you have to set up a temperature. So the creativity of GPT-3 answers that you have, like if you set it up, uh, to like basically answer your question, like with the highest probability, uh, and you ask GPT-3, what's the most common pet at home? it will answer all the time like dog, every single time. But like if you set the temperature like to be creative uh, of the answers, then it starts to make things up. Like it starts to become creative and it can like give you an answer like dolphin. Uh, so this is exactly what you have to pre play with uh, when translating something into a different language. Should the algorithm be creative? or not, and what's the temperature, the, the perfect temperature to get the perfect result. So I also, for example, played around with using uh, AI for uh, writing articles. Why not? Like, let's try to write an article using an AI. AI. And using GPT-3, the problem is that it started to get too creative. Uh, it, it went like, it was really perfect with writing short, like description of something, maybe a paragraph or maybe two, but when I forced it to write a big blog post, it's still not there, I would say. So the method that, for example, I used is kind of something that uh, 
is called cyborg method. So a combination of a person and a computer writing together. Uh, so like I can write with GPT-3 uh, an article, but like we have to simultaneously work on an article. Uh, and one plus one doesn't equal two. Uh, it equals more than two. Uh, so I like when I write an article using GPT-3, I try to add my brain power into what I exactly want to write about. Uh, but at the same time, GPT-3, for example, enhances my skills, writing skills. Like I wouldn't be able to write in such a way that it helps me out. But still, that's me writing with the help of AI. AI is still not there to perfectly translate everything. We need a little, a little bit of human power to actually have like a look at that. Yeah, as you were saying that, I was thinking about the translation process and how not only would there be a concern about how well or how correctly does the translation tool translate the web app on the fly based on the brand's playfulness, their their own culture, but depending on the language it translates into, it could potentially break the UI. It can. Like, if, for example, like I worked a lot with Arabic languages uh, where like even if you translate one page to uh, like a different one, uh, yeah, for example, the length of uh, words like in Arabic, when you, first of all, you write from right to left, not left to right. So like everything on the page is not just like reverting the page. It, it's much more difficult than that. But for example, Ara like words in Arabic are shorter and also the fonts render like smaller a little bit. So like it breaks everything on the page. It seems like we still have a lot of work to do for a tool that can translate in a way that also adjusts so it doesn't break the UI. And yeah, it's that could be a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar tool, but it would probably cost a billion dollars to build. Probably, yes. That's why like rewriting articles, like translating articles, I take into consideration that some of these things that like are translated will not be translated in a perfect way. Like. Okay, that's fine for me. Like, I'm okay with that. Is there anything that we haven't touched upon that you think is important you want to add? If you're scaling the business, like the most important part is actually to get traction on some kind of a way that you can scale your business and then you can make it predictable. The problem that I see with many startup founders is that they want to outsource everything that they can before they make it predictable and it will just not work out like if you find an agency that like will do certain things for you they will not probably not bring you results that you want so sometimes having the skills inside I, i'm not saying that you can't outsource things but like if you're starting a startup and you're starting to bring organic traffic in most cases it will work better if you have the skills inside uh, and you're able to make it predictable once you have it predictable, find a way to scale it up. That's not a problem. It's the same thing with sales. Like if you think that you can outsource sales to an outside agency that will outreach and contact your customers and everything for you, it will just not work out. And I know it's it's not fun in the beginning, especially uh, like, but you have to do it on your own. Like you have to listen to your customers. Uh, you have to find predictable ways of doing things. Uh, and another thing, because I like to work with a lot of startups, uh, I can see that many of them like try to uh, add, like find false barriers or like obstacles uh, or false assumptions, like something that doesn't exist. And they like to say like, I will not outreach to this person because they will never respond. So then I'm asking, did you try? No. So why are you saying that? Like, and the number of the false assumptions that they have, like on anything, about anything, is like tremendous. Like, I, I don't know why people are doing this to themselves, but like, just remove the barriers, like let the people answer. Uh, if you think, for example, with pricing, like uh, I had, <laughs> that was a funny story with one of my salespeople. I talked to my salesperson and he said that like this customer needs a discount. So like I asked him like why? 
And he said, like, no, no, like, they need a discount. Otherwise, like, they don't have a budget. They will not buy it. Like, okay. So what did the customer say? Oh, no, I didn't talk to him yet. Uh, like, don't build all these barriers, like, before you talk to people. Like, people, some, some of them, they don't need a discount, for example, uh, when you're thinking about price. Like, talk, ask, don't be afraid of that. So I'm in a situation right now where I'm trying to promote a consulting service. And part of it is the like series A round startups, right? They've recently just raised an A round. And the other side is the VCs who invested in them. So one person might think, well, I should just target the startup founder, right? Because they're the ones that need the help. But I took a step back and I said, yeah, but... I could promote to a thousand startups or I could promote to 20 VCs who invested in a thousand startups, or I could message both of them. So I chose to do an outreach campaign that focuses on both of them because why not? It doesn't cost me any extra, a little bit of extra time, but you know, making a connection with one VC with the right message could potentially give me multiple clients. Whereas reaching out to those same number of clients where I'm not being introduced by the VC, like I feel like being introduced by the VC gives it a much higher chance of success because the VC is like, yo, I'm, I've, I've given you a ton of money. I've given you millions of dollars. You need this guy to help you to grow, you know? So I, I, I am making an assumption that I think it'll be easier to convince the VCs to support us than to convince the founders to hire us, but I'm, I'm removing the potential for failure by targeting both at the same time anyways and seeing what happens. Yeah, you're just like reducing the risk. Like, let's try both of them. Like, let's see if where, where I will find traction. And once I have traction, I can put more money on that uh, because like you proven that something works or it doesn't and basically what you're doing it's a game of numbers uh so like how many people you will contact like it's kind of a luck but you're helping luck because the number of contacts that you will do will help you out with actually reaching your goal of course and thankfully we have like a really cool uh SAS report about ways that SaaS companies at the a rounds fail like how they fail why they fail and how you can kind of limit that failure so we think that'll be a good hook to get people to actually respond. Okay. Can you give me a glimpse how does this report? Why did they fail? One of them is bloat, right? Companies, when they raise millions of dollars, oftentimes the founders have never had experience managing seven or eight figures in their bank account. So they don't really know how to budget properly. They don't really know how to uh, plan for their workforce expansion. And they end up getting roped into, you know, hiring a bunch of people they don't need and you know getting a bunch of software that they probably don't need and paying too much for the software and so a lot of them die because they just don't spend properly um and so we talk about that another is uh you know these companies fail to really monetize properly and, and scale to become profitable because what they're doing is competing with other brands for functions and features and it's really a race to zero for their pricing rather than how can we extract the most value from our platform in a way that users actually want it? And that way we can, we can increase how much we charge, not decrease how much we charge. And so a lot of companies, their marketing is, is incorrect and in where it's really this race to zero and they fail to differentiate themselves and their pricing strategy supports that in a negative way. And those are just a few of the reasons why they fail. Yeah, when you said about it, I, I love to say like, when I'm looking at pricing of a startup, uh, I love to say like encourage abuse instead of limiting the usage. Uh, and I actually mean that because like if you, if the person will on the other side will see the value out of the tool uh, and will abuse your tool, that means they're using the tool. Like the more they will use it, then probably your profits will grow. Uh, but just coming up that you have to encourage it uh, and make the person on the other side feel that they can use it as much as possible makes a huge difference. Yes. So for example, one of the companies that are a competitor to my startup nerve is Slack. And the way that I looked at Slack's strategy was they're basically 
tying your hands and forcing you to give them $5 per user per month in order to get access to your full history. As far as I'm concerned, that's a bad strategy because people are not paying for your service because they like you. They're paying because they're pissed and they want their history because they're trying to run a company and you're holding their, their history from them. It's, 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 it's like ransom. You're forcing them to pay ransom. So I thought that was a bad strategy. So the strategy we were going to come up or part of the strategy we've come up with was we're going to let you have your entire history for free. All users, every, every workspace, they all get it for free. Why? Well, we can steal a large number of people that are pissed at Slack. So we, if we encourage the abuse of that system, as you said, then they're more likely to be willing to switch and then start to charge them for when we have a USP above and beyond what Slack could offer, which was our organizational system and uh, our deep integrations with APIs and all that. So, um, you know, we, we look at it as we would rather charge for something that adds value to your life than charge you for ransom, which is what Slack did. And so we thought there, we had a real opportunity there um, to compete in that regard. That makes sense, like a lot of sense. So how can people follow up with you? You can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Tom Winter, uh, or you can email me at tom at seowind.io, uh, which is a pretty uh, easy email. Uh, if I can help you out with anything, just like ask questions. Like I love to connect people with each other and I love to answer their questions on how to do certain things. So please contact me and I would love to talk to you. All right, great. Thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate your time and your energy. Don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And if you're trying to build your brand and launch into different markets, don't forget that the language you're using and how you're translating and the keywords you're using and, and how Google looks at the keywords you're using, all of those things are extremely important. So uh, if there's anyone you know that would benefit from this episode, definitely let them know about it. And we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you, Tom. Thanks a lot, Sean. Cheers, everybody.